What is up, guys? Alex here. Welcome back to another episode of the Anik Creates Podcast. Today, I am joined for a wonderful conversation with my friend Malcolm Cottle about the inauthenticity of drum parts in modern metal. And the reason that that is happening is to do with the guitar players writing drum parts for guitar players. We go into why that is and how that's actually a symptom of a much deeper problem in the modern music industry. Now, a lot of music critics love to talk about the things that are ruining modern music production, like grid editing on drums and guitars and everything like that, vocal tuning, drum programming, and all that kind of stuff. But I honestly don't believe that these are the reasons that people find modern music more boring and the productions different, and especially in rock and metal. And that is what we discussed today, starting off with the writing process, how drummers are not really as involved in the writing process of the actual drum parts anymore. If you're in a band or you're an artist, you need to leave the writing of certain parts to the masters of that craft. If you're a guitar player and you're writing a song, get a drummer to write the drum parts, but don't get them to write the drum parts too late in the production. Add them in early enough that you can still change the guitar parts and get the influence of the drums and the drummer's parts in your writing. Same thing goes if you're a drummer. You need the guitar player to be involved in the writing of the guitar parts. So they play something like a guitar player would, or frankly anybody that's writing a song. If you're writing a song, you need to to have the people who are playing the instruments be involved in the writing to some degree so that you actually get their authentic abilities and their authentic craft in the tracks that you're working on. Now, while the discussion centers a lot around modern metal and modern rock and the production techniques with drumming and the drummer's perspective of things, this is frankly a very good lesson for anybody to apply to themselves. We talk about how this is affecting music, but we also talk about what it's a symptom of, what is causing this. And that is frankly the demand of consumers. We discuss how that's changing the face of music production and music writing and what you can do as a consumer and what you can do as an artist to mitigate some of these things, to get back to authentic creating and putting everybody's authentic spin into the music that you're creating. So it's a very interesting discussion. And even if you're not involved in modern metal and modern rock or programming drums or anything like that, I think you'll still get a lot out of this. So without further ado, here's my conversation with drummer Malcolm Cottle. I feel like I always have to give a disclaimer every time I'm on your podcast. No, I think we, like, we both need to give a disclaimer um, here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like really this mainly applies to metal and rock, I would say, mm -hmm. like this observation that I've had. And like it kind of came about because I've been listening to a lot of different music critics and people that are in the industry, um, people that are just very critical of new music and seem to um, – feel kind of hopeless especially and i think everyone kind of feels like that at some point that like no new music is cool or that music's gotten boring or stale or whatever like that so there's like guys out there like uh glenn fricker from smg mm -hmm. and uh finn mckinty from uh the punk rock nba both of them as i've been listening to them for the past couple of years have been like highly critical of new music being stale or boring or repetitive or anything like that and you know i you know, every everyone in the music industry at one point or another has said like, oh, like new music is boring or stale or whatever. And it seems like most of the criticism is always levied against uh, production techniques. Mm -hmm. You know, like everyone says, oh, like auto tune ruined music because now people that can't sing are allowed to, you know, make songs or that, um, in, especially in the metal community, like grid editing is highly critiqued. It's like, oh, he can't actually play it. He had to get like the parts gridded or whatever. And drum samples. I mean, going back to Glenn Fricker has been a huge, huge critic of the use of drum samples. And to me, from what I've seen, these are the three main uh, critiques of modern music is this is what is making modern music bad, mm -hmm. so to say. And I, I guess I just like didn't ever fully agree one way or another. Like, yeah, I don't always love auto tune, but it's part of the modern production. The same with grid editing and drum samples. To me, even as a drummer, I don't think grid editing and drum samples are really taking much away from a drummer unless they're like truly awful. And these are things make, but like, if you're working, even when you're working with top quality musicians, these techniques are being used mm -hmm. to slide everything into place and correct everything, but or not correct everything, but just kind of perfect, I guess. Yep. And, you know, we can go back and forth on that. And for a long time, I've just been thinking like, okay, is this what's making music boring or not? And then I've kind of been on this idea that like, it, no, it's, it's down to the songwriting. The songwriting isn't as interesting or the songwriting isn't ambitious, whatever. 
And I was kind of on that idea for a long time. And then as a drummer, I just sort of gotten on this idea that like I am uh, – I love the idea of a bedroom producer or the bedroom guitarist. Like the idea that someone just in their bedroom like apartment can write a full production album and it sounds kick-ass. Like mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. But I think the problem is is that because of that revolution um, or that innovation, you could kind of say – of guitarists uh, who mainly do a lot of the songwriting, being able to do all the production em- elements themselves, they're approaching the music writing all from their perspective, and they're writing everyone else's parts. And I think this could actually extend to bass, too. I don't think it's exclusive to drums. Mm. But he- basically, here's my big hot take that we kind of got into and we'll get into right now, and it's that drumming – and drum writing is boring, and that's what's making metal and rock stale because drummers aren't writing their parts. Guitarists are writing the, all the drum parts right now. Mm. That's 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 kind of my thesis statement is songwriting, especially in metal and rock, is getting really stale and boring because drummers aren't writing their parts. Guitarists are writing drum parts and then just giving them to drummers, and that's really holding the industry back because I think especially in metal, maybe not so much rock, but especially in metal, like being a drummer – is an important element of the of the band of the song like the what the drummer contributes i think is quite critical to what makes a good metal band and especially a good metal song and because the drummers aren't writing their own parts the guitarists are writing them and when the guitarist writes the drum parts they're writing them one from the perspective of a guitarist and two to service the things that they want in the song which is the guitar parts yeah, yeah. so that's why like gent i think really took over especially at the beginning of this because Gent was so easy to write drum parts to because you just took the chugs or the rhythm guitar and you just matched the kick up exactly and you threw the snare on, you know, two and four or on <laughs> yep. B3 and done. And then just move the hand, move the right hand from a crash cymbal to a hi hat ever into a china every now and then and you're done your drum parts. Mm. And I think that's really like, so really that's it. Like drums, especially for me, I've just gotten really boring on a lot of records because all they do is just sync up with the rhythm guitar. And they're really not that interesting. They're not adding a lot of groove necessarily. They're not at, they're not adding interesting textures or counter um, uh, counter rhythms or anything like that. And a lot of the times, the, you know, the guitarist will write all the drums, hand them to the drummer, and say, "Okay, now put your flare on it." And that flare, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, so I'll just do a cool fast fill <laughs> because you don't know how to write fills or whatever. Yeah. But I, I think it's really affecting the songwriting too, because not only is it affecting the grooves and the rhythms, but it's the moments I've I've been listening to a couple records now with this new perspective, and you can tell when guitarists are writing programmed drums because it's like ah that they'll they'll do like a fill right before a chorus, and it won't really like launch you into the chorus. It, it it'll sound kind of like oh you're kind of trying to prove that you know how to program drums, but it's not servicing the song. It's servicing the guitar ports or maybe your ego that you have to prove that you know how to write drums so that's kind of my yeah that's kind of just the thing i've been on right now is that i i i love that we can program drums Mm. um but i think drummers are letting guitarists write all of their drum parts and then they're just learning midi and it's really holding the songwriting back and i think that's really one of the biggest things that is is holding metal back right now it's not auto tune it's not grid editing Mm. it's not drum samples it's the fact that one of the musicians in the band isn't writing their parts. And I think the same, like I said, could be extended to bass too. I think guitarists are writing all the bass parts too. Yeah. And, you know, there's bands that really stick out now too. If, um, with really good bass players, I think intervals is actually a great example of a band where, you know, Aaron Marshall's writing all of the music, but then he hands it off to people that are really allowed to do what they want to do with the parts. And you yeah. can tell that it's different there. And I think bass really sticks out. The drums really stick out for, for intervals, um, a host of other examples too, um, it, which we can kind of get into a little bit more. Um, periphery comes to mind. Animals as leaders really comes to mind. And animals as leaders is actually really quite an interesting uh, example, especially because uh, Misha from Periphery used to write all of the program drums for animals as leaders. Right. So like their first album, Misha programmed the whole thing. And I really, really think that if you really sit down and critically listen to that first Animals as Leaders record where Misha programmed the drums, and then you listen to later when Matt Garska joined the band yep. and he was doing his own parts – it's night and day. Yeah. It's like it there's this musicality that is just added from his drumming that is just incomparable 
to Misha's program Johns. And Misha did a phenomenal job. Most people did not know for years that those were program Johns because mm-hmm. he did them so well. But again, they're programmed because Misha is a guitar player. They're programmed from a guitar player's point of view. Mm-hmm. And so they accent things that the guitars are doing from a guitarist perspective, not necessarily from how a drummer would approach an arrangement totally. and look at a song and see how they could add their musical touch to the song arrangement to the different parts. And and you definitely see that definitely with Matt Garska's. I get what you're saying a hundred percent. And I think that uh, people can blame all those other techniques, but it's subtle. It's the subtlety of what a drummer would add. And mm-hmm. it's not something that you can quanti- quantify and say, this is what a drummer would do. There's more of these, you know, ghost notes or there's more of it. You can't say this is what's missing in the mm-hmm. programming. And I will argue the fact that it's not like we're using the example and the the phrasing we're saying is programmed drums, but it's not programmed drums. You can make good drum parts programmed, but written oh, yeah. by a drummer. And, yeah. you know, there's still tons of modern records that are 100 percent definitely programmed drums. And they're open mm-hmm. about it and whatever. They do it in their bedroom. They don't have a big drum room. There's tons of drum plugins. And, you know, they're that's totally fine. But they yeah, still... this isn't a rant against program drums. No. It's who's programming Exactly. Them. And I think that's the, the, the thing I just want to make a bit, a bit clearer is it's not the program drums themselves. It is the mm-hmm. act, how they're becoming the parts that they're becoming. And I think... You know, going back to your to your early point there about, you know, the early periphery and, and early gent, frankly, when it came out and it was very rhythmic and it mm-hmm. started out like, OK, let's, you know, get the, the, the guitar players or seem to be the producers <laughs> of this stuff. And so they're yeah. programming the drums just to get something out there and make it sound thick. And when they do that, they exactly they match the kick to the rhythm of the guitar because that's what they're doing. And when that started, yeah. that sounded really cool. And most of the drummers at that point were doing the same thing when they would write their parts themselves mm-hmm. because that was new and that was different. And that was like, oh, this is really cool because the rhythms of those songs were so unique and so different and so cool. And it was an evolution, too, over time, you know, because like Metalcore was doing it but just not making it the whole point of the song. And Hardcore was doing it before that, but it was only for the breakdowns. So like it, it was an evolution, but yeah, but then we get to this gent thing and it's it's just so upfront. Exactly. Like, this is the this is the groove of the song and it was cool. That's a good word, is the evolution is it seems to have stalled a bit <laughs> where it's not evolving to go, okay, now that we've got this, let's how do we make this more interesting? Well, the drummers mm-hmm. program your parts again and, and or or play them or program them, either one. Doesn't really matter. But you have to be involved in the writing. And I think there's also a side of this in the order of production. And I've seen this mm. before in uh, various situations, but a lot of smaller bands seem to record and write the song while they're recording. And that's the beauty of modern technology and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. That you can write while you record and record while you write. And I am I do it. It's, it's great. But they record <laughs> the guitar parts. They record all the stuff and program the drums and then layer and do all the stuff with their guitars and edit their guitars and put them on the grids and all this stuff around these program drums. And then they go, okay, drummer, now that everything's basically done, we're going to go to the studio and you're going to play the drums and put your flair Make on it. Make it real. Yeah. But, it, <laughs> yeah. but at that point, the guitar player, or the, the drummer is almost so locked in and has almost that oh, demoitis yeah. <laughs> so to a degree mm-hmm. of like, well, this is what it sounds like. I can't waver from this because they can't change anything that the guitars are then going to change. You know what I mean? Yeah, because there's not a lot of room for for their own input at that point. They can't really change the arrangement all that much. And that's kind of what I was saying at the beginning, too. It's like, yeah, because, like, when you do it that way, then what's the drummer going to do? Like, just add a cooler fill, maybe? Like, or just change a fill? And at that point, the drums have been so locked. Like, the programmed, the guitarist programmed drums have been so locked in. The guitarists are pretty, you know into that yep. like what they've programmed to and what they've recorded to so like the drummer's not going to get a lot of you know deviation totally. from that totally um and yeah and i think that's hurting the songwriting i th- i think it's hurting the quality of song i think the dr- i think it's fine to start with like some basic program drums mm-hmm. or you know better than average program drums write music to it but that's when the drummer needs to come in and have some input and be part it's of like it. okay that's not really how i think 
this should be done. I would like to do a double time groove here to kind of mix it up a little bit. Yeah. Or I would actually like to drop this into a half time and slow it, slow it down a little bit. But because guitarists in metal are pretty much writing all of the music, there's just not that time or that that consideration for a drummer's input. Yeah. And, you know, maybe it's harder too when you're not in a band versus when you're when you are just a one person production. I mean, that's those, those are kind of two different things. So like, I don't know at what point uh, a one person production might farm out the drums to a drummer to do or anything like that. But totally. definitely, at least if you're in a band, I'd say in still in that writing stage before you've locked anything in, the drummer should be coming in and, and yeah. contributing to the arrangement and to the parts. Well, because the drums are going to if everything. This is the same with mixing, same, any, any production, anything. When you make one choice, it affects the other choice, and then it affects the mm -hmm. or, original thing. And so you write a guitar part, and then the drummer plays something that they're kind of hearing, and then you're like, "Oh, that's cool." But if I do this with the guitars, and then the drummer's like, "Oh, well, now that you're doing that, I'm going to add this," and then you're like, "Oh, now that you hear," mm -hmm. and it goes back and forth. And I mean, we're talking about guitars and drums now, but that's with vocals, that's with lead guitars, yeah. that's with bass, that's with the rise and fall of the song itself, that's with the sound effects, that's with the dynamics, the, everything plays into that mm -hmm. and i think that they're not bringing in the drummer and the authentic parts early enough and you know so for instance one of the things that i like to do is when i'm writing a song when i'm working on a track i will you know program pretty not great drums but drums that i'm like this is dope to get me amped up about what i'm doing but the, mm -hmm. the sole purpose in a way is this is kind of what I'm hearing and it's either halftime or full time or hat or China or crash. That's the vibe I'm going for. And like a cool fill here. That's a drum focused thing for a minute, but that's what I'm going for. And then as you know, we've done these things together. I send it to you and go, okay, do your thing to it. Do what a drummer would do. Yeah. Add your parts. And then I record the final guitars to that yeah. because now it's changed again. I mean, we could go back and forth if we were in a room together, we could go back and forth a million yeah. times, but at least we're getting real drum parts authentically mm -hmm. in there that then the guitars get shaped around that. And I think that that is a, a, at least one step closer to having a drummer do exactly what they want and really having that back and forth for productions. Definitely. I think that's, a step up, a good step in the right direction and what most bands yeah. should do <laughs> actually. And if you want an example of that too, I mean the last two uh, covers that we collabed mm -hmm. on, you know, so like if you're following Anna creates on YouTube, um, Chuck has a couple of covers up that, uh, you know, that's exactly what we did is you kind of got a, a basic program jump layout. So I knew kind of like what you were going for yeah. in each section. But even then I changed some stuff and I sent it back. And I was like, Hey, that kick pattern, that rhythm pattern, it's really awkward to play on kick and I can't get it as strong. So I changed it to this because I think this is stronger yep. and leaves a little bit more room to like hit a little harder. And you responded, you were like, great. Sounds good. I'll just change it to that. Totally. Cause like it didn't like, it didn't change the part. It just made it a little bit more comfortable. Mm. Um, and it was still the same emotion. Emot it was still yeah, exactly. the same section in the arrangement and everything like that. Um, and I love that. And there was even one time too, where like, I played a cool groove and you were like, Oh, I really like that. We're going to double like this section. Cause I just want you to play more of that. groove. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. And just like, that's the fun of making music, man. Mm. You know, it's like not doing everything in a silo. Um, and like, I get it too. Like I'm, I, I'm not standing here or sitting here saying that like, you know, program drums are awful or that everything has to be like live recorded drums because drums suck to record. They're yeah. the worst. I mean, I love recording drum live drums, but don't get me wrong. Like they're the most expensive by far thing to record. You need the most equipment because you need 10,000 inputs Yep. Um, and expensive microphones. You need a space to do it. Like you can't record drums in an apartment. And I'm not saying um that that's like that's the difference there but it's it, it's again it's who is doing the programming mm -hmm. or who is making the calls of what should the drums be doing a drummer who spent 10 years learning and playing the drums yeah. and learning from other great drummers and learning what makes a good drum part or not or what what can the drums do to uplift like I don't know, man. It's like anything like I've heard a trumpet before and I'll program a trumpet into my arrangement 
um, every now and then. But like that's it, it's going to be completely different as opposed to if I give the part to an actual trumpeter and say like, hey, this is what I'm going for. Mm. Like they're like, oh, well, like these are the articulations I would use. This is like the the way I would phrase these elements that totally. are different, but going to enhance it and make it more trumpety. It's the same with drums. It's like the same with anything. I think yeah. if you give the <laughs> the musician that's spent their whole time perfecting their craft yeah. the chance to do that, it will sound better and get better. And I think and I, just to kind of return to my original thesis there, I think that's the biggest problem is because drummers aren't writing their drums. Yep. Guitarists are writing their drums for them and they're just kind of picking it up on the back end for the most part. And yes, there's exceptions to this. I'm painting with very broad strokes oh, absolutely. here. Absolutely. Yeah. And for most of the time, it's impossible to know. Like, it's impossible to know for sure on every record. Yeah. Like, oh, well, were these programmed and then the drummer learned them? Or were, are they completely programmed? Or did the drummer pro- – like, it's impossible to know. So I'm painting with broad strokes and making many assumptions. Yeah. I knew that. <laughs> but I but I think a, a keen listener can tell. And I think that is one of the things that is making – modern metal a little stale mm-hmm. and a little repetitive is because it's the same kind of drum parts over and over and over. Um, and, and, and maybe that's the thing too, is like, I have, I've been a huge advocate to other drummers now learn how to program, mm-hmm. just do it yep. because I think a lot of drummers are afraid of it because they're like, Oh, well, if I learn, if I, sh- if I reveal that programming could replace me, then I'll get replaced. I don't think that's the case. I haven't met a band yet that is like genuinely like, happy about not having a drummer and just programming drums i honestly haven't like they're fine to program drums to save money in the studio but i haven't met a single band that's like oh yeah we don't want a drummer we just want program drums and we just want a laptop in the back of the stage when we go live like no one no one wants that that. drums are awesome (laughs) and they're cool to have they look great and they are part of the live setting so i don't think drummers are out of a job just because of programming if anything taking on the role of programming jobs is going to save drummers a lot of jobs because then it's going to make them more useful in the studio. It's going to bring them earlier in, in the writing process because they know how to program drums really well. Yep. It's going to make the final record sound better because they're going to program drums one, how they can actually play yep. <laughs> two drums that they can actually play. And they're going to get all those little articulations. They're going to get all those little moments like, you know, dropping the uh, velocity a little bit on the left hand on a big snare run just to make it sound a little bit more realistic. There's all these little Little tricks that if you play drums, you're going to catch all these little things like how to program a hi-hat correctly. Mm -hmm. Drummers, if you learn how to program really well, you have made another job for yourself and you've kept your relevancy and you're going to be able to be in the room more yep. than if you only play acoustic drums where you have to be in another building. Yeah. you And, and frankly, you've <laughs> opened like, yourself. I liked how I did that. I spun that a little did, Yeah. <laughs> but, but frankly, you've opened up uh, to a whole other set of jobs because bands that don't want to or can't afford or whatever to go into a real studio for a week to record mm-hmm. drums and get the setup and whatever, don't have whatever they can still get a drummer sure. who can program the drums or you can be a part of it to do that. If you're a drummer that knows how to yeah. program or, you know, there's drummers that have their own studios and that opens it up too. if they can do it cheaply enough for bands like that, that's the same kind of thing. But, and if you could figure that out, all power to you. Absolutely. But even for me, I've found like in the demo process, like I don't want to set up all those exactly. mics. Exactly. And like EQ and compress and like process all those drums just for a demo. For me, I love just programming some quick, dirty, good sounding yep. program drums for a demo. It's perfect. Pull, pull up a, a library of drums and just start going and you can get your ideas out. I don't even have to like tweak it too much. I just pull up like Mjolnir, which is like all in the box, no like real options or pull up a drum forge preset or a slate preset and just go because it's more time to be creative. And honestly, for that, for me too, again, as a drummer, if I'm programming the drums, then I'm programming them in with my intentions already kind of baked in that way. And then I can listen back to those perfectly programmed drums and go, Oh, that doesn't really work as well as I thought. Or this, oh, or like maybe mm. that'll inspire an idea. It's like, okay, I copy pasted this like fill three times. How do I need to change this fill that transitions these two sections 
to make it more interesting or to help build the intensity totally. of the song um, and avoid that copy pasta kind of um, sound, which a lot of guitarists kind of have. Like you'll notice, like it's like, oh, that was the same fill, or this is the exact same beat. Yeah. Like there's nothing different about it, and it's a dead giveaway that it's like programmed or guitarist program yeah and so yeah I, I i tell every drummer i know like learn how to program if you, if you want to really do like if you're not just in a jam band or something like yeah. that and you're really trying to be like a drummer in the scene learn how to program because it'll save you a ton of time a ton of money and it'll keep you relevant and keep you in the room because you'll actually enjoy writing drums again yeah <laughs> as opposed to just getting them from the guitars to be like play that exactly okay exactly and you'll be in like you said in the conversation in the writing earlier because you don't have mm -hmm. to set up your drum kit and it's like, oh, we'll just do that at the end. It's whatever. It's not, you're not being stifled by that. You can be in mm -hmm. there because the d guitar player can do something and send you the thing. And the next day you can program it and, and send it back to them and have, it back. have a bit yeah. more of your authentic parts in there. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that this goes, this goes into the back and forth that that opens up and, yeah. Frankly, this is one of the beautiful things of programming drums versus live drums because it's harder to, you know, you record live drums and then you got to, well, one, you got to record live drums, <laughs> which is a whole thing. But it's a whole thing, oh, Chuck. It's, it's a pain, but we love it. But it's a pain, <laughs> but, we but love it's it. still a pain. But anyway, you have to, you know, you don't have as much of that opportunity. If that's all you do and that's all you think about, doing mm -hmm. then you you're closing off to the back and forth that you could have and i think that's one of the biggest problems is because there's no back and forth the guitar player might not even be trying to just write all the guitar parts or the or the drum mm -hmm. parts but they go well i can't do anything else with it so i'm just gonna do it and then there's mm -hmm. no back and forth because i can't send it to the drummer for him to put his stuff on because we can't afford to get it recorded right now and uh, all this kind of stuff so instead there's no back and forth until the last minute. And then at that point it's so locked in that everybody's just kind of like, yeah, okay, cool. I'll do a better fill there. But like the parts done yeah. and I can't change it because yeah, I can't change the guitar parts after this anyway. So whatever. Because everything's, Cause so, everything's locked so locked in, locked yeah, in it's all, yeah. because it's, because it's gone through the process, but there hasn't been mm -hmm. the back and forth in the process that there needs to be, yeah. which is what writing's all about. That's, you know, when you think about back, back to the day of the Beatles and all this, they'd sit in a room and they'd back and forth. Nowadays we have yeah. technology. We can sh do it over the internet. We don't have to be in the same room. We don't have to be in the same country, but there's still the, uh, the back and forth of writing for anything yeah. is, is still very key. I think like very important yeah. for the, for anything. Everyone wants to blame auto tune, grid editing, and drum samples, the production techniques mm. uh, for for the the state of modern music. And I always roll my eyes a little bit because, to me, the biggest thing to blame is is the consumer. I think the consumer is to blame for the way that music is made right now because the consumer currently has such a short attention span, right, and an unwillingness to stick out with an artist like if you're not releasing a single every couple of months you disappear fast and it's really hard to come back especially and as a small the artist. consumer especially as a small artist especially as a small artist so the economics of music not only like touring and production and everything like that but the speed at which things have to happen now have forced us to do these things like you can't you cannot expect a vocalist for example to go on tour for six to 12 months and then come home and cut a new record in under a month perfectly without any help at all. Like, you know, they haven't been, they, they've been using their voice rather forcefully for the yeah. last 12 months, come home, cut a record in a month and then go back out on tour for eight months to promote the new record yeah. and expect them to sound perfect every single time. It's impossible. Totally. Like they have, they have to have help. And if you want music that fast and that consistently from your artists, then you can't expect them to always be in perfect shape to deliver the perfect vocal take every single time yep. they walk into the studio. It's just not feasible. They can do it well if they're top of their game. They can do it well enough that auto-tune or pitch correction, I should say – just slides everything into place. You know what I mean? Because mm. that's all anyone has time for. And the same with grid editing too. Like we don't, the consumer isn't patient enough to wait for someone to write parts, learn those parts, and then perform those parts 
perfectly in a studio on the clock while they pay for it, or should I yeah. say while their label pays for it, and then they have to pay They're it all pay back, it back by going on tour. <laughs> you know, like it, like how can you expect artists to do that in a six month cycle all the time now? That's why everyone's trying to release EPs mm-hmm. more than LPs. Like LPs are disappearing because everyone only has the time and resources to produce an EP like once every six months as opposed to waiting a year, two years to release an LP. Yep. And that makes perfect sense, but that's just the economics of the modern music industry so i would really say that this like the programming drums thing kind of falls under the same category of the economics of the music industry do not allow for you to sit down back and forth in a rehearsal space working with a drummer to figure out the parts the the economics only really allow a guitarist to sit in front of their computer di right in put on an amp sim write some parts program some drums ship them out and say good enough go like and and so so with this discussion of like why is metal or rock stale, I th- to me it's always been those two. It's it's those two things that are most prominent in my mind right now. It's not production techniques. Production techniques are a response to a fast fashion style of uh, preference by the consumer yeah. in the music industry. The real problem is that the musicians themselves are not writing their parts. One person is writing their parts and then just sending them out to everybody. Yeah. Usually the guitarist. Um, and the vo- so it's the guitarist and the vocalist are the only ones really making their music anymore because the guitarist writes all the songs. The vocalist gets to come in and then kind of put their vocals on top of it. But the bass just gets to follow whatever the guitar was doing. Yeah. And now the drummer just gets to follow whatever the guitarist was doing. And and that's a real shame. So we have these kind of two competing ideologies of like we want things to be more authentic and we want things to be real. Um, we don't like autotune and we don't like red editing and drum samples are just ruining everything. It's like, no, the consumer is ruining everything because there's so bloody impatient they yep. don't want to wait for high quality things but they want it tomorrow they always want it tomorrow and if they don't that musician's career isn't lasting very long because they're disappearing so fast so like so again i'm getting right off track here but since we're talking about authenticity and music and just sort of like i think that's the problem is that bands especially in metal have to turn out so much music so quickly there isn't the time to sit down and do it all the traditional way like yeah. it's been done in the past there just isn't the time there isn't the patience you have to get moving. I think that you, you're right with the fact that uh, with metal, it's very apparent because metal and rock, well, not all rock, but that style of rock, heavier rock, is not a overly lucrative uh, genre, generally. Oh, no, yeah. You got to scrape for every penny. Exactly. Like, you know, Periphery is a very big band and they've come out in that genre. They're, you know, they're, they're the pathfinders. They are. They made the genre almost. You know, it, to oh, a degree, yeah. and yeah, in terms of modern metal, I'd put them top three, top five, exactly. Easy. And they're very honest. And Misha's come out and has blog posts, and they have companies left, mm-hmm. right, and center. And they're going, yeah, we don't make money off Periphery. We make money off of stuff surrounding Periphery, but the actual music and Periphery touring doesn't make us any money. <laughs> and they're yeah, they're very they were honest very about upfront about that. In uh, the, they released a documentary of the making of P three. Yeah, and there was like a whole section kind of dedicated to how, like. This isn't a lucrative yeah. endeavor for them at all, and that, and it's really obvious that it was shortly after that that they really started like launching their companies, yes. like the pedals, the software, the drum libraries, all started coming out. Yeah, and it's funny too because I think Periphery is such a perfect um, uh, uh, case study for for this because like. Misha programs drums, but then he gives them to Matt and you'll see like in all their documentaries, Matt is there and he's rehearsing with them. So he's like hearing the program drums, but he's still in the practice spaces and able to kind of go a little bit back and forth with them. And it's not until that process is more or less done yep. that then he goes to a studio with Nolly and actually cuts the final drums while they're still like layering all the guitars and everything yeah. like that. But, but he's part of the writing process. He's part of the arrangement process, even if it's starting with program drums. Totally. And, and I think that they have that luxury because they've decided it's worth it. And we want to do that. Mm-hmm. We know we're not going to make money off this record, so we might as well do it right and be happy with it for ourselves yeah. because that's all we really have. <laughs> So they've accepted that and they are deciding this is how we want it to go. And I think Mm -hmm. that it comes out and that's why Matt, they have that time to do the back and forth so that each person can really put in their flavor of things. And it shows in the music because they do sound like the drums in that one, especially they sound phenomenal. (laughs) Like he, he is a drummer in that genre that can still bring out such 
beauty in his drum parts like yeah that sounds like him <laughs> you know and there's a perfect example of like you know like they use drum samples yep. they grid things but i swear like when you hear that drumming you know it's mad help oh, like you 100%. just know like it's just like 100%. it's under nice like yeah you can just tell by the just the way he phrases things the way he accentuates different things and there's a great example too of just like the way he accentuates the guitar parts is very different than a drummer than a guitarist would just program the drums to totally. just hold down the beat you know he really loves accenting the chord changes and stuff like that um and he likes kind of going off and doing his own little kind of tom runs and then coming back and building it up again like yep. his drumming is undeniable and there's a great example of a band that knows like yeah we can program drums to like get the songwriting process started but like at the end of the day this dude needs to be like allowed to write his and perform his drum parts. Yeah. The thing with Matt's drumming too, is they have, they have MIDI uh, packs of his drums of beats and still mm -hmm. in the MIDI packs that are programmed drums that are MIDI that are gridded. You can still tell that it's him yeah. because it's so real in terms of what the beat is. It's not a guitarist beat. It's a drummer's yeah. beat. It's a drummer who's studied rhythm. Exactly. And studied the application of rhythm in songwriting. And you can tell. You can tell. You can just really tell. Yeah. Like, yeah, Matt's just like one of those sort of like PhDs of metal drumming. Like he just, he just Amazing. lifts it to a different level and it's phenomenal. And, and you're absolutely right. Like I've, um, if you explore any of those groove packs from him, it's just like, yeah, you could put that on any kit and it sounds it's like Matt sound Albert like it, yeah, drumming. Exactly. No matter what you're playing behind it. Yeah. No, it's, it's very <laughs> true. Now, the interesting thing with this, too, is I think it goes the other way as well. We've been talking a lot about the fact that it's guitar players programming drums and are the main writers, typically. But I would yeah, argue... Yeah, we've been trashing guitar players a lot tonight. I know. <laughs> but, but I would also go with the other way, which, frankly, solidifies the point of you need to get the master of the craft, whatever it is, to do their mm. part and to do the back and forth and to allow them, whether that's a guitar player, whether that's a drummer, whether that's a bass player, whether that's a vocalist, whatever it is, to be part of that writing process, to be part of that back and forth. Because mm -hmm. there are records that come out that are starting from a drummer perspective or a drummer is the main engineer producer in the band mm -hmm. or in the writing or whatever and they write the guitar parts to go along with it and it sounds very drummer e <laughs> and you know i sounds of horus <laughs> there's one but the guitar the guitar parts have a lot of the rhythmic element and and they they just they feel like that. They feel very well with the drums. Mm -hmm. So it almost went the other way <laughs> where yeah. the drummer, you wrote the guitar parts to go along with the drum beats that you made. So they lock in in a different way. But I yeah. would also say like uh, um, Chris Turner, there's enough of mm -hmm. his stuff. He's a drummer. He writes the songs. Yes, he gets a guitar player to play them like his, his uh, Ocean's 8 Alaska guitar players play the parts. And mm -hmm. there's I mean, I'm yeah. not saying that they're bad. They sound great, but you can tell that they're heavily influenced by the drums and they're created to to lift up the, the, the drums. The drums. Yeah. They're supporting the drums. Mm -hmm. They're not on their own just like, oh, my God, this is the best guitar player, the best guitar parts these guys have ever written because they're not. They're great guitar parts and they work really yeah. well with the song for the intention of here's an amazing drum pass. But it still is it goes that way as well as and I, and I think that's what we're getting at is that you know variety is the spice of life like if everything was written like chris turner we would be saying the same thing but just like why aren't guitarists right. writing their parts anymore exactly. like everyone's and you can program guitar i've done it but i've also given those parts to a real guitarist right. and said hey can you just like play this but like on a real guitar and they looked at it and they're like uh no this isn't like <laughs> written like you can play it on guitar it's written like you can play it on a midi keyboard yeah exactly <laughs> um and, I, and and so it's just like you have to have i think you just you have to have variety when it's all one or the other that's what kind of makes everything kind of sound the same yep. and, and stale and that's i think really what's happening to modern metal across the board for the most part is that a lot of drummers are just playing what the guitarist wrote for them yep. and a lot of guitarists are only kind of scratching the surface of what drums do to an arrangement how drums accentuate songwriting and how drums actually really fit with um 
uh, with guitar music, yeah. to be to be frank. One of the uh, key things for bands, frankly, like you kind of said, drummers need to learn and should learn. And I think it's vital for them to learn and accept programming and get to that point and learn how to program. I would also extend mm-hmm. that out to new bands. If you're a, if you're an up and coming band, if you are, you know, a band that's got to go on tour 12 months of the year, <laughs> whatever, you know, l- learning how to produce yourself and each one of you learning the basic skills even of logic or pro tools or Cubase or whatever you want to use. doesn't really matter. It really literally doesn't matter, but learning enough so that you can give things back and forth and both work on everybody work on their parts involved in the record. If you can't sit down and play together because you're all in different countries or different States or on tour and literally just can't sit down and, and jam all the time, Everybody should be able to have enough of a base knowledge to be able to be involved in that or set your writing situation and your production situation up so that you allow for that. Allow for the drummer to come over with an e-kit or something to the guitar player's house early enough in the productions and be involved in Mm -hmm. that to be a part of that. Whether they know how to program it themselves or not, set it up for that. Same with the bass. Get the bass player in there. Don't just have a guy write the whole thing and here's the final production. We're done. Unless, of course, that's the point of the band. But, you know. Thanks, Bob. Just play the root and we'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but I think that is what's going to help a lot of uh, a lot of this and yeah. I think would help modern music get better because you can really tell the bands that that. I think allow for more of this, allow for that back and forth, like periphery, uh, pull, yeah. Or and, the bands that just have a, uh, an actual drummer, an actual drummer, an actual guitar playing player playing the guitars, stuff. an actual drummer playing the drums, an actual vocalist doing their thing with the vocals. Uh, you know, that it, cause there's lots of those kind of things too, where it's like, well, here's the melody that I I like over my guitar part, play that or sing that. And it's like, okay, well, yeah. you no know, one, like this is boring from a vocals mm-hmm. perspective. Like it goes with everybody. You, yeah. You got to let the player play their parts and do their parts and be involved in the writing of their parts. I just think every band should be as good as Periphery and Protest the Hero, and then we would be fine and metal would be safe. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Oh, uh, yeah. That would, that would, that's be not nice. a tall order at all. No, no, it, absolutely <laughs> not. No. And, uh, you know, to kind of, um, wrap this up and to kind of, as a consumer, I think people need to accept, uh, or encourage the bands that they like or whatever um, in different ways. And don't try and press yeah. them to make a record every month because you're going to get corners being cut. And that's one of the corners that's going to be cut, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And drums is a big one. Drums is an obvious one because they're the diffi- the most difficult to record. You can't do it in an apartment yeah. at one in the morning. You just can't. So <laughs> you can do guitars like that. You know, frankly, can't do vocals like yeah. that, but you cannot do drums like that. You can't even do drums in an apartment. I, I think you're right, Chuck. I think um, if if you want to, if you are one of these music critics of modern music that you want more authenticity and you want more um, quote realism, yeah, and less like processing and less like corner cutting or whatever, then you have to advocate for giving bands and musicians time. Yeah, you have to give them time to do it. You can't be on tour for for that long and then go straight into the studio and cut the best vocal performance of your life. It's just not going to happen. Yep. Uh, give the bands time. Give the artists uh, the room to write and to practice and then go in and get those performances in the studio. Um, support them on all the different ways too. Like don't just listen to them on Spotify. Like listen to them on Spotify, but also download um, their albums from Bandcamp so that they actually get a decent cut there. You know. Follow them on all the social media and support them in all their other little ways by their products because that's what's going to support yeah. the studio time to be worth it because otherwise they're taking a hundred and twenty grand from a from a label that they're going to have to pay back over the next ten years and and then yeah I don't know regret the whole regret, thing yeah so, literally yeah, yeah I think that's a big thing let drummers drum and let me and give musicians the time to make great music I think that's that's what it all comes down to for bands allow give a place for your uh for your fans and for people one be honest with them and tell you I need time to make great music so support me <laughs> uh but give them opportunities like a patreon like 
Just ways to mm, sell mm-hmm. things, something that people can buy. I mean, yes, make it a good experience. Don't just ask for money. Like, do something. But allow for that. If all you do is put songs out and put it on Spotify and that's literally all you have, th- yeah. no wonder you can't make money off of it. <laughs> so You're not inviting you're them not in. You're inviting not inviting them in. So invite them in. And if you are a, a consumer and you do see that with your favorite bands, actually engage and actually support and allow them to do that. And I think that's kind of the key that's going to make music better (laughs) and allow for artists to be their most authentic self, which at the end of the day is, is what we want. We want them to create their most authentic music. Uh, it's what everyone's complaining about. uh, Exactly. So if the, I'm sure there'll be another problem that comes up that somebody's going to complain about if that gets solved, but (laughs) the way (laughs) of the the other problems that we've been suppressing, (laughs) uh, But I think that's a great place to end, man. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. (laughs) You'll be back on again soon, whether you like it or not. (laughs) Whether you like it or not. I'll just invade. Yeah, (laughs) as seems to be the the way, isn't it? (laughs) We should do another podcast takeover, maybe. I I like it. Let's do it. We'll we'll figure that out. All right. You guys can all uh, be prepared for that coming up soon. But that is it for this episode, guys. Thank you so much for listening and uh, for watching if you're over on YouTube. And let us know what you think. Go and comment in the video on YouTube um, because that's a lovely place to be able to have an actual conversation, whereas podcasts don't allow you to really respond. So go over to the YouTube channel and comment. Let us know what you think. Let us know what your take on this is because... Uh, maybe we missed something. Maybe there's a different side of this that we haven't thought of. And I'm, I would love to hear that. So go leave comments and let us know what you think. And we'll see you in the next episode. Until then, always be creating. <laughs> Why have you not done a metal remix of your podcast music? Honestly, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs>